making those observations early on, especially at winning time, I really can make some good decisions moving forward to understand what I can do better with those groups. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I am your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with beef industry experts and leaders to improve your own operation. Speaking of improving operations, I'd like to personally invite you to attend my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are Q&A calls between cattle producers and industry experts that allow you as the cattle producer to enter a community of people who support and push you to find those improvements and connect with experts who can answer your questions and guide you in the right direction. You can find out more about these events and how to sign up by heading over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. And while you're there, if you sign up for my newsletter, I'll send you 22 ranch management tips for free that have been shared by the gurus who have been on my show before. Remember, the best way to support podcasts is to share, rate, and review the show so that I know what episodes and content you like and want more of. With that, let's connect you with this week's guest and expert. All right, Ray. Well, welcome back to the show. I always love having these conversations because you and I get to dive into like the nitty gritty of data collection all the time, which for me as a seed stock producer and a commercial cattleman is super important. So I'm excited to have you back and talk a little bit about how we can get folks on track for 2023 record keeping from record keeping from calving through, you know, whenever those um, animals are leaving their operations, however, they're set up. So thanks for joining. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. Um, Well, I, like you said, I'm Ray Williams. Um, I'm with uh, Gallagher Animal Management. Um, I'm the uh, director of technical operations and learning and development and uh, been in the field for about 10 and a half years working with producers all across the country uh, and Canada. And uh, I've learned that uh, everybody does it a little bit different, but there are a few commonalities that make it work um, really well for a lot of folks. So this is a this is a big deal for a lot of folks that uh, getting ready for for uh, spring calving and um, and winter calving too for that matter and just getting the records in in line. So yeah, so to kind of start off, you said there are a few commonalities that really make sure things work because you're right. As beef producers, there's a lot of different ways to do things, and there's yeah. no one size fits all approach. So what are those? commonalities with record keeping that are certain that they're going to help keep your operation on track and in line and eliminate some of those messes and frustrating times and the, well, did you write this down or did I write it down or where did it go? (laughs) What are some of those commonalities that can help folks out? Well, you know, and, and my grandparents, they, um, they wrote it all down. My my grandmother had a ledger, and she she wrote down all the information as 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 they went out in the field and um, got calving records and such. Um, and I think that I I've learned a lot from from that and my own experiences and such about you know get the basics down quickly because you don't have a lot of time. Of course, you have a mama cow that's usually pretty antsy anyway, you know, and trying to keep her at bay while you're trying to get all this information and and um, but if I can at least get the basics like the sex of the animal, um, get the uh, the date of birth of course is gonna be um, pretty obvious, but just just make some observations. Um, how how was the birth? Was it uh, was it complicated or did I have to uh, did I have to pull the calf or you know obviously those are things that I want to record against the mama cow as well, just to kind of make sure that we're doing everything we can be for genetic purposes and that that type of thing. But just making general observations about a calf is so important to do. And, uh, you know, we were talking before the, before we started about some of the, the crazy things that are going on, you know, you're, you're getting um, everything from DNA samples, right? And mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about what you guys do. What do you guys do when you uh, have calving season? Okay. So we are one of the crazy people who fall calve in North Dakota. Well, we, yeah. we call it fall calving, but it's really like, 
mid-August, so like, you know, August 15th to September 30th, we really try to keep it that 45 day mark. Yeah. And we sink our whole herd. So a lot of those calves come on the very front end of calving as they should. So really what we do when we calve is usually there's anywhere from two to three of us out there, um, checking cows, taking data. We try to take two at a time, just in case we need help. But if one person has to go, that's fine. We calve out in the pasture and we'll go out and we usually enter information into our phone. Um, my mom's got sheets set up that work for her on her phone. So we go out and we look at who's close to calving, what's already calved. We record, you know, date of birth, the sex of the calf, the, um, who the dam is. And then we go back on our records when we get back to the house to make that tag and look at, okay, who's the sire supposed to be like, if, you know, it's an AI sire, we obviously have that information on the front end. If we're going to have to take a DNA sample, we'll leave the sire off the tag, but each calf gets its own unique tag. Like Mm -hmm. if, if they were born in 2022, we use two as the first letter. And then if it was the first calf born, it'd be calf 200. And then the second calf born would be 201. And so we go down like that, but we, we take those observations. We talk about if the cow had trouble calving or if it took her a longer time, or if we actually had to pull or assist it, I mean, was the calf backwards was, did the cow have an attitude issue? That was a little (laughs) much for us. So we take all that information down, but, um, and yeah, no, we're a registered herd. So we're DNA everything. We use EIDs, we tattoo. And so, but we do a lot of that when calves are closer to weaning, just because they, that's a lot that happens to the calf's head. So we try to not, not put as, not put too much stress on the calf at one period of time, if we can help it. So, right. and that's why, you know, and we take birth weights at calving too. Obviously we, we don't use a tape. We actually lift them up and weigh them and use a digital scale, but. Right. Do you use a sling uh, to put underneath the calf and lift so them we have a we, suspended scale? We've tried slings. And we have a hard time keeping the calf in the sling. And we've tried a couple different versions. Like we've tried like your traditional sling. We've tried the ones that kind of wrap around their front and back end. And they still kind of seem to slip and slide all over. So we usually end up just tying their legs and then um, lifting them up with a digital scale. We have a, um, a, our local blacksmith made a, and my dad kind of teamed up and made a cool, um, device to help lift the calves. It actually hooks into the back of the side by side. So then if they're a little heavier, anyone can do it, but yeah, no, we haven't had the best luck with slings personally. Well, I had a customer recently asked me about that and he said, well, um, how, what's the best way to weigh a calf in the field? And they're always looking for some kind of device and whatnot to, to help them get that done and, and, and do it in a short order. And, you know, with the side by side or a four, you know, Mm -hmm. or an ATV out there, um, you know, some of them have come up with different, different apparatuses, uh, everything that from a, a, a Z rack that um, pops into the back of the, uh, the stinger yeah. on the back of the rig. And, uh, with a hanging scale, you can usually get the animal up in the air and enough that you can get a, a good weight quickly. And then, um, yeah, you keep moving. So, um, things happen pretty quickly. I'm sure when you're out there working, um, well, trying to get things done, I mean, obviously, I mean, yeah. And like, you don't, you know, it's, it's a stress on the calf a little bit. It's a little stress on the mama. So you want to be quick and get the calf back to its mama and sucking and doing whatever they need to do. But so I know like on our operation, there's multiple people collecting that calving data and ultimately it gets back to one source. So like, what do you see on that end with producers, Ray, as far as making sure that data stays organized if, you know, maybe multiple people are out there? Well, and that's kind of one of the reasons that we kind of have in this conversation, because um, we get that a lot, too. Um, that, you know, advice, what, what advice do you have about that? And we, we tell folks all the time, I said, you know, it, whatever works for you, but, you know, to get it back to the office or get it back to the house in a way that you can read it and, and, and get it recorded or enter it into a computer or whatever you need to do. Um, 
but yeah, you, you know, you start out in the morning or it, even before that with a game plan and um, you have, um, if you're going to have other people doing records for you and with you, um, it can be written down. Like you said, I love the fact that you put it on the phone. Um, I think that's really smart because everybody's got their phone with them, right? And um, even just setting up a template of some sort, just to something that you can record information quickly and uh, and then get it back in, in one format that you can get it imported into the computer. So it can be, you know, um, attached to a permanent record for the animal. And uh, yeah, that I see folks do all kinds of things. I mean, from the very basic record book, the calving book that you, you've seen for years and years and years, and um, all the way up to electronic means um, that, uh, you know, I have some customers that put the EID tags in at birth. And while that isn't ideal for everyone, right? It's not everybody does it that way, but um, you can record um, information on a reader now um, where it has the ability to um, have a, the, the mothering menu where you can attach the mama cow to the calf and then put in the traits right there on the reader. So if you're doing it by yourself, that's one thing. But if you've got other people helping you, that's ideal, you know, to help keep things and keeping an eye out from the mama cow. I mean, yeah. that's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've talked about selecting for disposition before too, but like, I mean, calving is one of those times where, you know, her hormone levels are going to be at peak. Yep. She's going to be in her highest protective mm -hmm. mode as she ever possibly will. So, I yep. mean, yep. there's but different opinions on measuring disposition scores, but for yeah. us, that's when we measure it because if that's where we're going to have to be the, in the closest proximity to her, when she is, you know, at that level at her peak protective mode, really, that's right. where we like to take that measurement of what is her disposition. And I, it's nice to going back to the phone records I like to have it on the phone because like you said, I always have it. I always mm -hmm. have my phone on me, but growing up as a little kid, I remember my dad coming into the house and he'd start washing his hands at the kitchen sink. And all of a sudden he'd say, grab a piece of paper and write this down. Cause he was halfway through <laughs> scrubbing off whatever note he put on the side of his hand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So at least if it's in a simple form or a text message, whatever it is, you're not going to scrub it off or lose the calving book or wipe the dry erase marker off the windshield. I've seen a lot of that from folks. So <laughs> that, that actually came up the other day. I was at the Angus show and uh, some, one of the customers came up and said, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, applying records and things like that. And they said, well, the windshield was a, was a marker. It works just great. And I said, that's awesome. <laughs> Um, my, my wife, uh, we used to homeschool our kids back in the day and, um, the chalkboard was the front window of the, uh, in the house and, uh, they, they you do dry erase all over the, uh, the window and that, that worked effectively well. I mean, I'd come home and you couldn't hardly see out the window. There was so much stuff on it. So that's one way. And then, uh, gosh, um, one customer said, yeah, use two by four, do whatever I can find in the back of the pickup. And of course, um, it's usually the, the the husband and the wife that are standing there at the, at the, in a booth, let's say, asking about scale equipment or readers and, and that type of thing. And uh, he says, "Yeah, it's time to get a get a get a method of recording information." And she says, "That's right, because I'm tired of getting it back at the house on a piece of wood or something that's got blood or something else on it." Mm -hmm. And because um, it can hardly read his writing, or he messes up the numbers or whatever, you know. So it's. Uh, yeah, everybody does it different, like you said, and um, the the phone is, uh, I think, becoming the catalyst now for a lot of things, and uh, we're certainly listening as a co corporation and uh, as a company that's, that's interested in, in becoming uh, or having solutions for efficiencies on, on collecting data, and uh, we recognize that too, and we just want to have a way to if you enter it on the phone that it's it is organized and it is transferable quickly out of the phone into mm -hmm. a program you know so especially for the registered herds like you work with and whatnot so yeah well registered and even you know the registered folks are we're going to be taking more data than the typical commercial cow calf producer but even right. for that commercial cow calf produ producer those records are equally as important especially as you know 
DNA testing commercial herds becomes mm-hmm. more popular and data collection overall. I mean, it's valuable from a production standpoint, a financial standpoint, and just making sure that your business is sustainable and able to be passed down to the next generation if right. you wish for it to be. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and I want to personally invite you as my listener to take the next steps in improving the profitability of your operation by signing up for my 2023 Rancher Mind series. The Rancher Mind program consists of producer-driven monthly calls that cover topics such as developing a reproduction program, labor challenges, cattle marketing, business development, and goal setting. I bring on industry experts each month to answer your specific questions. I also provide extra resources and a place for you to keep networking and moving forward without requiring you to leave the ranch. For more information, head over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and select the Rancher Mind event tab. Let's keep moving individual operations and our industry forward. Now, I want to go back, and you and I had talked about this a little bit. I mentioned how, like, my family has our tagging system for numbers. What do you see as an effective way for people to give that calf a unique ID and when to do it, especially as we go about entering this information digitally into pre-created templates and platforms. Like what do you see as effective and ineffective? Well, um, a lot of producers across the country um, in the past have just made the calf number, the same number as the, as a cow, um, as a dam. And while that, it, it, it works well for those that are not really keeping a digital record. It, it's a disaster when you're trying to do digital recording. So keeping a unique number on, on the animal is absolutely paramount. Um, what you guys do, what the date at the beginning of the prefix is really smart too. Um, and you, you know, I'll, you can still keep the essence of the, the mama's number mm-hmm. uh, on the cap until at such time you maybe have a weaning, you, you you know, you, you change the number at some point, you can always do that. But if you can put um, a majority of the mama's number in there and then put the, the date, and then it just keeps things straight. Um, there's also a, the international date um, code system that's been adopted by literally everybody in the, all over the world. It's a, it's a great, it's a great system, um, but it's an alphanumeric type thing where mm-hmm. a, a through Z represents a number, um, a date or a, a year code. And, um, B, C, D, whatever it might be that year, you know, would precede the uh, the mama's number on the calf. So it's just another way of of keeping the numbers dissimilar, um, because that that that's that's really the, the the best way to keep things and keep everybody individual. So you can have an individual record um, down the road if you want to in the digital market and the digital pieces that you're you're working with as well. So. Yeah, my um, grandpa and I use the alphanumeric system on our commercial cattle so yeah that is it is nice to be able to age your cows and um off that letter Mm -hmm. and still be able to tie it back to who their dam was as well right so that is you know and and we'll leave a um a link to that that worksheet or that sheet Mm -hmm. that uh is uh, the international day code and it is it's something to consider if you if you don't already have a already have a, a regiment for your tagging um it's a it's an easy way to to reference your animals as you move forward and uh, yeah it's it's awesome it, i use it all the time and people from all over use it so it's a, it's a good way to do it you know whatever works for you i mean whatever you know whatever works for you in your operation well and i think that's that's the big thing and we've already talked about it a little bit is that it has to be something that works for your individual operation and yeah. makes sense for those who are helping. And one of those challenges is having multiple generations on an operation who all yeah. have to be able to understand right. and use information effectively. And, you know, that might, in my mind, the older generation, like I'm not going to get my grandpa to enter yeah. calving info on an app necessarily, but right, right. I know. I mean, but he is a little more tech savvy than he lets on. He can FaceTime and, (laughs) (laughs) but um, 
he has a hard time with buttons on yeah. iPhones because his fingers are so big, but right. he will keep calving records. And every time he comes in the house, I can look at his calving book and I can put it in my phone if I need to. So right. there are ways around it. Now we're kind of talking about like, you know, getting started on the right foot. And we've talked about like, you know, kind of different ways to keep records. We talked about people who use the calving book to the windshield to <laughs> using your phone um, and trying to get things on a digital format. We've talked about individual animal ID and making sure you have a good system there and kind of tying that back even to understanding the cow's birth date and age. Yeah. What else do you think, you know, cattle producers need to keep in mind and have a good system for to make sure that their records are in line throughout the year? Well, you know, um, there's a lot of things that can happen during the early stages of the calf's life. And, um, you know, uh, that first vaccination time about three months in, you know, is a good time to kind of measure things up again and just kind of compare that calf to the rest of the herd. Um, and if you can get a weight on the animal at that point, if you can't, I mean, sometimes it's just impossible because you're just, you're just trying to either get them, um, you know, like I said, first vaccinations are branded or whatever you're going to be doing that first three months. And then because some people don't even see that calf again until weaning time, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, establishing an average daily gain is really important. Um, by the time you get to weaning time, we want to really see how the, that animal performed. And if there's, you know, a death or some kind of a, a problem that's happened or the animal gets sick, um, it's it's so important to really make sure that that's recorded too, just to kind of see what what the the symptom is and what what the issues are. Um, and any type of issue that could cause trouble for you the rest of the, the, the herd is is really important to keep track of too right then in that that, that first uh, few months of life there um but yeah that's from that first set of, of data at, at, at the beginning of life all the way to weaning time um everything that happens comparative to the dam's weight and you know weaning time to make sure mm -hmm. that the animal has grown um, to the right spot um, is so important to, to understand. And so when you guys wean your cow, uh, your calves rather, um, what are the measurements that you're looking for right then and there at that time as well? You know, we take those weaning weights and, you know, as we're taking weaning weights, we look at how are they measuring up compared to the rest of the herd? Right on. And how are they, how has that cow been measuring up year after year? You know, Mm -hmm. Are her calves consistently at the top? Are they right in the middle? Or is she, you know, producing calves that consistently wean on the lower end? So, right. you know, weaning weight is that biggest measurement that we look at. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, weaning is also when we preconditioning and weaning is when we go through and take those DNA samples and right. tattoo and brand and EID um, spread out. We try not to do it all at one shot. Right. Do you find it, you find it tough um, once you gather all that data to sit down and kind of analyze things to what, 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 what point do you sit down and just go, gosh, um, especially after winning time um, to really evaluate the dam's performance? You know, we try, but it's probably something we could do a little better job at because we'll look at the sheet and info briefly, you know, it might be the next day after weaning because everyone gets tired, right? No one wants to do office work right after yeah. they've been outside all day. But we look at that calf performance and, you know, we do look at how that cow performed, but it's something where we could, you know, probably do a little better job at it. But, you know, making, having any cattle producer try and sit down in the office can be a challenge because yeah. a lot of why we do what we do is because we love being hands-on and right. out there working. but. I think it's a mindset shift that needs to happen in the industry is to spend a little more time looking back at those records and that cow performance. Well, and it kind of ties back into even at breeding season, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, if that information is gathered season over season, it certainly makes a job at breeding time a lot easier too. If I've got a cow that's been uh, exposed or has been AI'd and, you know, how has the performance been? Um, did she take the AI or not? Um, 
you know, what, what year over year have happened? Uh, has she, has she been open more than once? Um, you know, there's just so many genetic things that we're looking for, right? That um, this information is just, it cannot, it, there can't be a, enough of it actually in my mind because um, I want to make money on on my animals, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it, it's, it's an expensive operation if I don't keep track of the things that can cause, can cause trouble. And I look at these records as one of the best ways to, to, to know what to call, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what is it? What, first of all, what does it cost to grow an animal? And then my calling decisions have to come from these records as well. And I've got a really good memory. It's just not very long. You know, I think we all suffer from that. <laughs> we make well, observations, right? And then we think, oh gosh, I'll remember this. And I don't because I need to have it in front of me when I'm, when I'm working animals, especially at breeding time as well. And that is, you know, that breeding time. So with our calving period, we AI would our cows a few weeks ago. Right. Yeah. And that was something that when we were going through and trying to determine those matings for AI, that was something where we were saying, you know what, this cow hasn't been performing. She doesn't get to be bred again, yeah. you know, and we have a, we don't really have any tolerance for open cows on our operation. <laughs> <laughs> There's, they don't, they don't get a free ride. So, no, no. but it's too expensive, but we have to keep, but we keep those records, you know, mm -hmm. if she's left a calf, I mean, sorry, right. but we can't afford to keep you around if you're not going to produce. Well, and, you know, even keeping records um, that can help me make a, a better sire decision too. I mean, I'm looking for a small calf that grows fast, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yet, um, you know, the, the pairing can be off a little bit and we can have trouble, but that sire with a different, with a different dam does a phenomenal job, you know? So um, there's all these observations that can be made. And you know, like you said, there's some that you just can't have any tolerance for because they just do cost your operation of feed and the everything that goes into an animal, um, if they're not going to produce, it's just not worth having. Um, so yeah, this is, this is all part of the cycle of, of this information, this data. And, you know, I talk to college kids all the time at, uh, some of the schools and, um, they're worried. They're like you, they're, they come back to a family farm and they want to be successful. They have a family to support. And this, I, I you know, I, I, I know that there's a lot of folks that, that don't embrace technology the way they we, we think they should. I mean, I'm getting old and I, I have trouble with technology too, but I've learned that, um, and I know a lot of producers have the same story, that they've learned that there are tools that make it easier for me to pay attention to more details. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key to this. Um, yeah, my grandfather and my grandmother probably wouldn't embrace the, the technology that I you know work with today. But um, if they could have seen the results of some of the data analytics that we could have looked at, and just looking at information on a paper, they can see um, stats that actually can help them do a better job. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, the kids say that. They say, well, I'm going to take all this technology home and I'm going to, I'm going to you know, put it on my family farm. And, and <laughs> the follow-up is sometimes it doesn't go so well because dad... Um, has a way of doing it and that's the way it's going to be done and um but they come around i mean they come around they see the efficiencies if you've got a a good group of cows and you can make some some good decisions based on some great data that's that's what they really need and that's what they want too so you see some conversion and then i've <laughs> seen people come to the booth um and to our you know and we, we talk to folks all the time all over and um I've got one customer um, down in uh, Southern Missouri and he's 75 years old and uh, he has his smartphone. Um, he doesn't like it as well, but he loves the scales and the readers so he can take care of information a lot faster. And like your dad, he's got, he's got big fingers. So it's hard for him to hit the buttons all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, we've developed some technology that allows him to speak text, you know, um, and you can do that on the phone too, but um, he talks to the phone 
and talks to the app and it, it, uh, it just dictates all that information in for him. So, I mean, we've got, there's all kinds of different ways to take care of this information and get it back to where it needs to be. So, well, that, that speak to text is a really nice feature. And that's really nice if you're out in the field and don't want to take your gloves off or if exactly. your hands are dirty, right? Like <laughs> that's just a really good feature for everyone, whether their fingers are too big to hit all the buttons or not. I mean, you know, you, before we dive into like specifics on types yeah. of technology, um, I want to touch on something you said, you talked about change and how people come around. Yeah. One thing I learned in one of my business courses in college was that going through a change is the same as going through the stages of grief. Yeah. So, you know, kind of think That's about so true. So next time you want to take, you know, make a change, think about those stages of grief and what other people may be going through, because to me, I hear change and I think innovation and that's just exciting for me, but for other people, it's different. So Mm -hmm. that's sometimes what I try to do. And I mean, I'm fortunate. I'm, I come from a progressive family. So usually my parents are quite a few steps ahead of me, but every now and then (laughs) (laughs) we have our moments. (laughs) Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I just, you know, we've talked about types of records, ID systems, um, ways to take records, but what, what does the technology look like today? I mean, you already talked about the speak to text feature, but what, how can producers create that fully integrated system on their operation to make it easier for them, even though it's a change? Right. Well, I mean, if they're uh, if they've got a computer and they've got the ability to, um, you know, they're on the internet and they can open up an app that or a piece of software that, um, I use the word dashboard a lot. Um, it's a uh, basically just seeing a lot of information in in some pictures and some graphs and seeing some feed efficiencies, seeing herd performance efficiencies, all in you know one shot. Um, the technology is driving to a simple format that allows you to see a lot of information quickly and make um, decisions and and about animal sets and groups um, really, really quickly. Um, I guess one of the things, too, is that the shotgun approach, as they say, um, is one way of seeing it. But there's going to be questions. I mean, you can go through a lot of data quickly and just look for exceptions, you know, um, I, I teach that to folks all the time. Just, okay, here's a string of data that's got all the animal information on it and it's all lined up in a column. And okay, now go down this column of average daily gains as an example and pick out the ones that are not normal because you can see an average. You can literally just by looking at it, mm-hmm. any trained eye can look at it and say, hey, this is odd, not right. So you, you, you hit one of those animals that's off, way off um, or you, you sort it by the the smallest or the the least amount of average daily gain to the largest and then kind of analyze the top and the bottom of that list to see what makes the most sense and you can see trending um very quickly um, by just doing that one exercise alone and while we use average daily gain and the overall herd bell curve um, from the lowest, you know, performing to the median, to the high performers, you know, on the other side of the bell curve. Um, I want to see that information at fingertip and I want to see it on my scale. I, you know, if I've got an animal in front of me, I want to see that history right now and see where that animal falls within my herd. Um, animal performance can be measured, uh, you know, a uh, uh, hundred different ways, but I'm, I'm looking for herd average. I'm looking for herd dynamics. Um, if, if I'm not getting what I need, I can take that subgroup, that, that's the group that's not performing, and put them on a different ration, let's say. Sort them off, put them in a pen, and feed them differently. And then I don't have to spend the money on the whole herd to get the whole average up to one, one way. Um, and then my high performers, yeah, I take good note of that. What is that? Why is that happening? Um, what's the the genetic pairing there that I'm, that I'm doing really well with and I need to do more of that. Right. Um, so it's, it's kind of like managing people. <laughs> I <hate> to say <laughs> <it this way. laughs> 
<laughs> you know, in HR dynamics, you see the the the, the graph that says, okay, you'll spend uh, eighty percent of your time with the bottom one third of your of your team. Um, you have the middle group that are performing and doing really well, and um, you challenge them, but they're very low low risk. They're just doing their job all the time, mm -hmm. and then you've got your high performing group over here that are guy. Hey boss, what's next? And you go that way, and they go that way. It's very similar to raising cattle because you've got that low performing group, and you spend a lot of time, you know, trying to save them. They're expensive, right? Um, and you analyze why they're not performing. You analyze their genetics, everything about them, and um, that is all just basic information that I can look at in a in a very quick snapshot on my computer. Uh, the software is designed to make it easy to do that. And um, then I can make my own lists. I can make a list of um, animals that I want to focus on. And when they come through the herd, I just sort them off and I pay attention. I make notes that are alerts that come up on my screen and tell me, remind me that this is an animal that I, that I previously looked at a stat on. And I want to look at this animal in person and say, hey, I need to make a change here. Yeah. So you guys do as that? you... So as you scan the animal, yeah, the alert pops up automatically for, you know, so, you know, whether it was a reminder to like, mm -hmm. as like a non-breeder or you needed to maybe yeah. take another DNA sample or whatever it right. might be as she scanned, he or she is scanned it, the alert is reminded or you get an alert. Yep. Yep. And you have to either, you know, delete the alert or, you know, keep it and, and look at it. And, you know, I found that um, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for those low average daily gains, um, a lot of reasons. And um, they could be an injury, they could be bad teeth, they could have, uh, you know, I, we have found abscesses, um, all kinds of issues with the animal um, that caused them not to eat or drink, and to to be a low, um, a low weight, um, and it can happen rapidly, right? So mm -hmm. I think the more exposure I can get to the animal and I can see the animals, um, the better job I can do. But that isn't always practical to do, right? Um, I can't see them every week or every two weeks sometimes. Um, so making those observations early on, especially at weaning time, I really can make some good decisions moving forward to understand what I can do better with those groups. Well, that's really interesting. Now, Ray, as we kind of wrap up our conversation and yeah. time today what are your final thoughts that you'd like to share with those listening well i think you need to come into the season with a good plan as i mentioned early on um decide what what metrics are going to be most important to you in your operation um if you come out with um a a, a system that allows you to record whether it's by yourself or whether you have a group of people like you guys do, um, you know, have everybody lined out on what that that's going to be. And then a data data dump strategy when it all's done, you know, where where's that information going to come to? And then who's going to look at that information and help make some reports and decisions on what that information looks like. But um, it, it has to be a it has to be a strategy that that everybody's committed to. And because when you're in the heat of things, it's just too late, right? It's just mm -hmm. it's just too chaotic to to try to put something together then. But um, make good notes. Be disciplined on the notes that you take about your animals, because it will jog your memory and help you do a better job. We're in this to make money, right? And profit can be wasted so quickly if we have the wrong animals and. Um, so making sure that everything is is tight and that I'm analyzing the data that uh, is, like I said, most meaningful to me in my operation, all the way to the end. And when I'm getting carcass data back from the process, um, I want to look and see what kind of job I did. You know, um, that's the that's the report card right there. You know, when uh, I get my my carcass report back and I can apply it to my herd and I can say, okay. These animals that I shipped off, this is what they came back as, and this is the genetic performance that I that I achieved with that. So I want to do more of that. 
Well, thank you very much, Ray. And I'll be sure to put some of those links in the show notes yeah. and descriptions for those listeners who want more information. And uh, yeah, just thank you for oh. coming on today and telling folks how they can be a little organized to improve their profitability in the long run. I mean, that's what this is all about. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, Shay. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.